Welcome! It's Ashley from Demystifying Your Health. I am so glad you're joining me today. In this episode, we're going to be talking about angina. So you're going upstairs to go to bed. As you're walking, all of a sudden you have this sharp pain in your chest that you actually stop on the stairs to see what's going on. Thankfully, it goes away. So you continue to go up the stairs and get ready for bed. Well, this happens again the next day and the day after that. What's causing this to occur? Is it serious? So angina is chest pain that's a result of reduced blood flow to the heart. Obviously, blood carries oxygen. So when the flow is reduced, not enough is getting to the cells. In this case, we're talking about your heart. And this is known as ischemia. This means basically lack of oxygen in your cells. A main reason for the decreased blood flow is coronary artery disease, or CAD, or CAD. And this is the result of your arteries becoming narrowed due to the buildup of fatty deposits, also known as plaque. And this whole process is known as arthrosclerosis. Keep in mind, this takes years to develop, so it's not something that's all of a sudden going to happen overnight. This is why angina, it typically affects people middle-aged and older. And because of it takes so long for it to develop, your body actually compensates for the decreased opening and that way you know, you're able to function. The reason the problem arises is when you increase the need for oxygen in the cells and your body's unable to meet that demand because it can't get the blood flow through the narrowed opening. And this is why as plaque continues to build up, it continues to narrow those openings, making angina more likely to occur. And there's two main types of angina. You have stable, which is the most common. And this one lasts a short time, will get better usually with rest or there's specific medications, which we'll touch upon here in just a little bit, that can help reduce the angina. And there's a very distinct, usually pattern, severity, duration, and characteristics to stable angina. Unstable angina can occur at rest. It's often unexpected and it is different from the usual pattern, means it's usually more severe, it lasts longer, it just feels different than the stable angina. And it's not relieved by rest or medicines. And with this, it can often signal that the person's having a heart attack. So this is, if you notice any of those type of things happening, definitely call for emergency personnel and seek emergency medical treatment. So let's take a look now at what symptoms is you're more likely to see with either both types and obviously the difference there's between men and women. When it comes to angina symptoms, The biggest difference between stable and unstable is the severity and the duration, as we talked about just a minute ago. Pretty much otherwise, the symptoms are the same. When it comes to differences between gender, men and women, men are more likely to have any of the symptoms that are listed that are basically from here, which is dizziness up, and I'm gonna talk about them here in a little bit greater detail. Any of the ones you notice with stars are symptoms that women are more likely to experience. So obviously a big one is chest pain or discomfort. And this can be described in a variety of ways. This can be a pressure sensation, a squeezing sensation, burning, fullness. For women, they often might describe it as a stabbing sensation. And in some cases, women don't have any chest pain at all, which obviously makes it very hard for them to know that they're actually having an angina episode. And in some cases, it delays them in seeking treatment because they aren't aware of the fact that you know they're not having the standard chest pain so yeah I know everything's fine well they might have some of these other symptoms and this is why it's so important for women to understand yes your symptoms might be a little bit different than men instead of you know just the classic if you will angina symptoms so another symptom is pain that radiates from your chest to either your arm your neck your shoulder or your jaw you can also have nausea fatigue shortness of breath sweating dizziness And once again, women are more likely to have stomach pain or back pain or discomfort. And they're also more likely to have nausea, shortness of breath, and a stabbing sensation if they do have chest pain. And this is why it's so important for women to understand because obviously what we hear in the news and has been reported for years is the 
classic symptoms of angina, but that's the most studies had been done on men. So they didn't realize that women actually had a different set of symptoms in some cases. And this is why so many women aren't aware that they're having, you know, angina and heart problems until something major happens. And then they end up at the doctor's office and, you know, they run an EKG on them or they're at the emergency room and they're looking at it and they're like, yeah, you had a heart attack. <laughs> Tell me about it. And they're like, no, I didn't. And it's, there's markers that show up even years later that people don't realize. So that's why it's so important for women and men, because obviously you have women in your life that you care about. If you, if they're telling you they have any of these, make sure that they're getting the help that they need. So when it comes to treating angina, there are two main goals. First one is to obviously decrease the frequency and severity of symptoms. And then the second one, which is to decrease the risk of heart attack and death. So there's a couple of different options, but the primary one that most doctors start with and obviously are going to be focusing on is medication. And this is important because there's obviously, as you can tell, several different types. So I'm going to go over them here briefly. With nitroglycerin, the whole point of this is to increase blood flow to your heart. And it does this by dilating your blood vessels. The big thing here is that it can cause a rapid drop in your blood pressure because it dilates it so quickly. So depending on the severity of your angina and the frequency of it, your doctor is going to recommend a couple of different things as far as taking nitroglycerin. Sometimes they only recommend if you're having an angina episode. So it's basically like an emergent drug. So if it's really bad and you're having pain, take nitroglycerin. Other times your doctor might have you take it before you're doing some sort of physical activity where you know you're going to be exerting yourself because this is going to help dilate the blood vessels. And sometimes, depending, your doctor might just have you take it as a daily maintenance type medication. If that is the case, they might also consider calcium channel blockers, which are very similar to nitrates in how they act within the body. They just have a longer lasting effect without the rapid drop in blood pressure usually. The other big concern, obviously, when it comes to angina is not only the narrowing of the arteries and obviously that rapid dilation, but it's your blood pressure itself. Because when you have high blood pressure, what is happening is your blood vessels are constricting down and that's causing your pressure to go up, which obviously when you need your pressure to go up during certain situations, that's important. And when you have arthrosclerosis, where you've got narrowing in your arteries, when you have high blood pressure, the problem is it's even reducing the flow of blood even further. This is why controlling blood pressure is so important. And there's many different chemical processes that are within our body that are responsible for our blood pressure. This is why there's many different classes of blood pressure type of medications. And within each class, there's several medications. And each one works a little bit differently. So I'm not going to get into the full nuances of all of them, but I just want you to be aware that there's different classes. The three main type are beta blockers, the next one is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors and then angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs. So those are the three main classes and depending on your blood pressure, uh, how high it is, how severe, how long it's been elevated, you might be on a combination of these medicines in order for it to be able to come down. And this is why it's important to talk to your doctor. They're going to probably have to do some trial and error to find the right combination that is best for you. Another big concern is obviously with the plaque. The plaque is usually made up of fatty deposits, which we also know as cholesterol, which while some cholesterol is important, it's not a good idea to have too much. So there's a class of medications called statins that help to lower your cholesterol. So this is important as well. So your doctor might place you on a statin in addition to blood pressure medicines in order to try to help you with your angina. And one last one, because obviously a major concern with angina of any kind is that with the narrowed opening, blood can get actually clotted off and you can actually have a blood clot. And this can be anywhere within your body, whether it's within your heart, within your brain, within your leg, within your lungs. Obviously, when blood flow is restricted to any part of your body, it's not a good thing. So your doctor might prescribe anticoagulants. Many people call them blood thinners. They don't actually really thin your blood. What they do is they prevent the platelets, which are responsible for clotting, they prevent them from 
uh, sticking together because platelets are sticky. So think of when you cut your arm and all of a sudden, you know, blood comes up and then within a few minutes, as long as it's not a deep cut, all of a sudden, you know, it starts to get sticky, like the blood sticking. Those are your platelets in action. So when, in that case, that's a great, you know, you need it to stop the bleeding. Obviously, when you're inside your veins and arteries, when a the platelets start to clump together and stick together and form a blood clot, that's not a good thing. So the anticoagulants prevent the platelets from being able to do that. So they're not really thinning your blood, it's just making it, if you will, less sticky. And then if for some reason you're having severe angina on a frequent basis and the medications aren't helping and your doctor's concerned that you might be at high risk for having a heart attack, they're going to recommend some form of procedure, usually either angioplasty or bypass surgery. And angioplasty is a little bit less invasive than obviously bypass surgery. They usually go in through an artery, either in your leg or your wrist somewhere, and feed a catheter up to your heart. And then they inflate a little balloon to where there is plaque. And what that does is it sort of breaks up the plaque. And then that way it opens up that artery essentially, you know, to allow more blood to flow through. Big concern with that is obviously risk for blood clots. So that's one of the major concerns. So you'll definitely be on anticoagulants after the procedure to help make sure you don't get a blood clot from that. And then with bypass surgery, what they're actually doing is if a artery is so clogged up with plaque and other things that is, there's no blood flow to get through and angioplasty won't work, they will go in and actually take a vein or smaller artery from somewhere else, or sometimes it's a graft, so it's a synthetic made material, and actually bypass that blocked off artery. And so they then, you know, attach that to your heart and divert the blood flow around the artery that is clogged, essentially. So those are obviously extreme cases for those who have severe angina on a frequent basis and are at high risk for having a heart attack. So as you can see, there's a lot of different options when it comes to treating angina. And this is why it's so important to talk to your doctor, let them know what's going on. And that way they can help devise a plan that's best for you. So that way, as we talked about before, the two main goals, obviously you want to get rid of the symptoms, manage those as much as possible, and obviously decrease your chances of having a heart attack or dying. So definitely talk to your doctor if you notice that you're having any of these symptoms. The good news is angina is preventable. There are several things that you can do to reduce your chances of getting it. The first is maintaining a healthy weight. And obviously the two key things here are eating a balanced nutritious diet and exercising regularly. While obviously those are important to being healthy overall, it's especially important for your heart. So make sure you're doing both of those so that way you don't end up with angina. Next big thing is you don't wanna drink excessive amounts of alcohol. And so this means no more than two standard drinks per day for men or in one standard drink per day for women. Keep in mind, standard drink is different depending on what type of alcohol you're consuming. So if you're consuming wine, beer, or hard liquor, each one, the standard drink size isn't the same. You also want to manage stress, because stress isn't good for any part of your body, but especially your heart. And don't smoke. Obviously, this is a big one. This impacts your body in a variety of ways, but especially your lungs and your heart. And you want to keep other health conditions in check, because when you do that, this helps make sure that you stay healthy overall. No one wants angina, so do everything that you possibly can to avoid getting it. If you already have it, do everything you can to manage it to the best of your ability with the help of your doctor. Thank you for joining me today. Hopefully you found the information valuable and helpful. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, hit me up, send me a message, comment below. However you want to get it to me, I'd love to hear from you. And until next time, Stay healthy.